we start our first uh, half of our lecture with subject matter related to extinction, the extinction of man. What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about, um, I'm saying that in this channel, right? We say that we are the last humans on earth, the last generation of humans on earth, whatever generation means to you. We've got very little time to live. We're not going to live decades. We're not going to live centuries. We're about to die as a species. We're going to become extinct together with all the other mammals. This is the end of man. And uh, people have say, Bill, you know, you're a little pessimistic. <laughs> no, I drink beer and wine. I can't be pessimistic. No, I'm realistic. That's what it's called. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm urging you to get your feet on the ground and maybe this is not a good idea if you want to live life maybe you should forget about what I say in this channel <laughs> it's not a very popular channel in that sense you don't want to believe in the theory you want to believe that maybe you got a hundred years in front of you but you know one thing is having a false sense of security and another one is reality and so what I'm saying I'm not pessimistic I'm realistic Okay, and uh, some people would rather listen and learn the what the theory is about, and other people dismiss it altogether and say, no, 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 I don't want to even hear it. <laughs> okay, your choice, you know, that's fine, no problem with me. Anyways, here we have some news. It's got to do with this bug called Omicron. What the hell is Omicron? Well, it's a variant of COVID. You know, we had the Alpha, Beta, Zeta, whatever, <laughs> uh, Delta, and now we have the Omicron. And I'm sure there's going to be a couple more. And that means we have all these variants, okay? And the new one is Omicron, and now they're going to shut down the world, apparently, in some place, especially here in Europe. I'm in Germany. I think they're going to be shutting down Europe during the winter. And what I mean by that is, you know, um, international travel is going to be a problem and hotels is going to be a problem, restaurants are going to be a problem, anything that has to do with leisure, like physical leisure, where you go with your personal body, you know, is going to be switched off, okay, and uh, I don't know if that's a good idea, okay, but anyways, let's get on with the uh, headline here, it says the following, it says, um, UK economy slows in third quarter before arrival of Omicron, in other words, before the uh, Omicron, already the UK economy was uh, apparently having some problems. But that's not why I put this article here. I put it because of what it says in, in you know, I just pulled out these snippets out of there. It says, in output terms, the largest contributors to the increase in quarter three were what? Hospitality, arts, <laughs> entertainment, and recreation. And in contrast, production and what construction both fell, and also they say motor vehicles fell for the third quarter uh, consecutive. And what is this telling us? That means that uh, the whole global economy, really, because this is England, right, in the UK or United Kingdom. But the issue here is that all these advanced nations have this exactly the same problem. So what we see here is really a microcosm of all of Europe all of the Western world, perhaps all, all of the planet, okay? You have countries in South America. I was talking about Argentina the other day. Um, sure, countries in Africa have similar problems. What are they all experiencing? Well, they're all experiencing the same exact thing, no matter where you go. And that is that everybody is developing those uh, non-productive segments of the economy, and what's falling as a percentage of GDP in every country on the planet is uh, the production, the, uh, the stuff that produces something tangible. And it turns out that the tangible stuff is what creates growth. And I keep giving you that scenario. You and God are next to each other, you know, you're, you're both embracing yourself. You're looking down on the planet down below, right? You've got, you're up there with God, right? You're seeing the whole planet. What do you see? Well, you see what's being produced, what's physical. You see the houses, you see the highways, you see the bridges, you see the ships, you see the cars, you see the airplane, you see the tangible stuff, you see the fields of corn, the fields of wheat. That's what you see. That's real. That's growth. And what's expanding now is what? Hospitality, arts, entertainment, and recreation. 
what the hell is that? Well, that's all this abstract stuff. In fact, what, what all this really is, is internet. What's expanding is the internet, even at the expense of manual services such as barbering or landscaping. What's expanding is the internet. So we're all moving into the internet. And the question is that I ask foolishly, people don't believe, don't uh, even understand sometimes, uh, can we run a world on leisure, on just abstractions? And all I can say is food for thought, okay? Can the world just be run on abstractions and commercials that, you know, ads that they put on the internet to stimulate the abstractions? That's what we have today. That's the world of today. So yeah, um, the uh, UK economy in, in a way is giving you an idea of what's happening in the world and why we're approaching a point where, you know, uh, it's all leisure, it's all vacation, it's all fun, you know, uh, entertainment. Can we run the world on entertainment? Some people will say that you can. And I take the opposite view. <laughs> My five cents worth. Okay, anyways, I'm going to tell you a little story today. And it's got to do with, uh, probably some of you heard of Hans Christian Andersen. And other people even have never heard of this story. So I have to go through the story first. Okay, it's got to do with this Omicron thing. Okay, and it starts like this. It says that there was a king, an emperor, and uh, he heard about these two weavers that could weave the best cloth, the best suit, you know, the best robe for a king that you could imagine. And so he wanted to meet these two fellows, okay? And so here's the uh, king meeting the two fellows, okay? And they say, look, we can make a, a robe for you that will knock you out of your socks. And the king said, okay, and I kind of like that challenge. Uh, okay, I'll hire you. So uh, they hired him, the two uh, fellows there. They started weaving, and they started weaving inexistent, invisible, intangible threads. And I know people say, hey, Bill, that's your thread there. <laughs> it's invisible, intangible. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't tell me what I know already, okay? So these two weavers, they started weaving intangible threads and they went through the motions. In fact, that they had no threads. They just went through the motions of weaving thread and making this uh, robe for the king. Obviously, an invisible, intangible um, <laughs> um, robe because there was nothing there to begin with. Okay. Okay, so uh, the king, you know, heard that these guys were working there, said, told one of his ministers, you know, one of his dukes, his, his counts, he said, go out there and see what, what they're doing. I want to see what the, uh, tell me what the robe looks like, more or less, what, it, what it's starting to look like, you know, because I'm going to be wearing it in public. I want to know what it looks like. And so one of the guys comes over here, and uh, the, the uh, pitch that these two weavers were saying is that anyone who could not see the th robe was not deserving of their position. In other words, here we had <laughs> electromagnetic threads. Yeah, here we have a situation where, you know, if you couldn't see the robe, if you couldn't see what they made, their, their argument was that anyone who could not see it was not deserving of their position as a minister, as a, you know, as a right-hand man of the uh, king, of the emperor. So this guy comes over and he doesn't see anything. And so he wonders, what am I going to tell the king? He's, he's a little worried because he doesn't see anything, but he says, I can't let him know that I don't see anything because these, you know, the king knows already, has been lectured, has been um, led to believe that anyone who can't see the robe is not deserving of his position, of his job. So he says, Oh, it looks so wonderful. What a beautiful robe. <laughs> okay. And then uh, the king sends a second uh, fellow, you know, and he looks at it and he says, uh, same thing. He looks at it. He says, I don't see anything. Could be that I'm not deserving of my position. You know, he says, uh, it's beautiful. It's, it's exquisite, you know. <laughs> so he starts believing in the robe. And the king third sends another messenger, you know, another fellow. Uh, his right-hand man, maybe even his son, and he says, uh, what do you see there? You know what I mean? What does it look like? 
Is it good? Uh, you know, your other two ministers said it looks great. And the guy doesn't see anything, but he has to, you know, play along. He says, oh, it's just absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> you know, and so, the, so they all just fell in for the uh, ruse, you know. They said, yeah, the robe is absolutely exquisite. It's great. It's lovely. And that was finally the king's turn. You know, the emperor has to come over and he has to look at it. And he also wonders, you know, what how beautiful this robe is that they prepared for him, you know. And he goes in there. And he says, okay, yeah, I've come here to see the robe. I want to see what it looks like. And when he looks, he can't see anything. And so now we have a problem because, you know, the, the other fellows behind him say, well, nobody can see anything, but everybody has to say that they did. And the king himself, he says, am I not deserving of my own job? No, of course not. So he has to fall in line as well. And he says, oh, it's ravishing. You know, it's the greatest thing that I've ever saw. Okay. And so, you know, the uh, story, go as the story goes, you know, uh, the uh, king ends up parading naked around the city, okay? And it's just a little boy, I think his name is Bill Gady, <laughs> who says, uh, the emperor is nude, he's got, no he's got nothing on. <laughs> and, you know, all everybody just says, no, no, it's, it's a great robe, I love it, you know? <laughs> and uh, the guy's parading naked around the city. You know, so that's uh, that's how the uh, story goes. I think it's a great analogy for what happens in relativity and mathematical physics and quantum and uh, string theory. And here's the uh, um, relativity version of this. Okay, here you have the emperor's tail, and they say it's uh, space time, and people say, "Oh, space time looks so great, so beautiful." What are all those dots there? Oh, those are the black holes. And what's all that fuzziness that I see around the galaxy? Oh, that's dark matter. And yeah, you can't see or taste or touch or any, anything with those. And the reason is very simple. You know, these are abstract concepts. You know, black holes a singularity. A space time is what? Space and time is time a physical object. And dark matter is just a bunch of particles, you know, just a concept there. And so, yeah, these are concepts. That's the problem, okay, with this so-called theory of relativity. And then you have, uh, you know, the quantum, uh, also the, the quantum fells, the people, they have their own tail. It looks more or less like this. Uh, it's the wave function tail. You know, and again, uh, people say, well, what are you staring at? Well, we're staring at a wave. And what's a wave? Well, it's this function that has, you know, fields, uh, two fields. And what flows in one direction is energy. And all these are concepts, and obviously you can't see them, but you have to make believe go through the motions of believing that they exist and that you can see them okay and here we have uh richard Feynman. he says he's going bongo over this yeah no kidding okay yeah you got to go bongo over this nonsense of um talking about uh, abstractions and turning them into physical objects and you say bill what does this have to do with omicron well we have the same situation with omicron with this virus okay and all I can show you is, is the following, okay? Here's uh, the, uh, the two weavers, and they say, here's the Omicron bug, the virus. Do you believe in it? Can you see it? Can you touch it? Are you aware of it? Do you believe in the theory, or do you accept the theory? Do you understand the theory? Okay, that's the issue here. And, uh, yeah, here you have um, the Clovid flowchart to get down to the bottom of this issue. There's uh, people out there who will tell you that this Omicron, not even Omicron, the COVID, is a ho uh, hoax. It's not real. It's uh, something run by the politicians, the Illuminati, etc., etc., the New World Order people, the people who rule the world, the, the filthy rich, you know. And this is a hoax. You don't have to believe this COVID thing. Don't get the shot. You know, it's probably going to do more damage to you than anything that you ever thought about. And so I created this COVID flow chart to, to get to the bottom of this. I mean, if you're really honest with yourself, if you're objective and you really want to get to the bottom of it, you might want to follow at least some of these steps in the flow chart. Okay. And, you know, we, we bring back to life Mr. Alhazen. And he said, you know, whenever you analyze a theory, 
the first thing you have to do, especially with those theories you believe in, is attack your theories with the utmost vehemence. You know, become an enemy of your own theories. Okay? And so if you can attack your own theory with everything you've got, with everything you can think of, and you come out on top after that, then at least you know that you can defend your theory from anyone who can attack it because you have more or less, you know, resolved all your arguments. Okay? But if you just have a belief and say, well, I don't believe in the COVID. I don't believe that this is real. I think it's a hoax. Well, maybe you have an unsubstantiated belief because you have no backing for your theory. Okay, so what I'm suggesting is you follow the flow chart. It's, I think, a minimum required of anyone who really wants to be honest and get to the bottom of, you know, his, uh, his beliefs. You're going to hold a belief of a theory, right, of an explanation. I think you should more or less follow this flow chart. Okay, recommendation. Okay, and so the first question is, is there an object called a virus? You know, some people don't even believe that there are viruses out there. So obviously you cannot talk to them about a, an Omicron or a, whatever, a, a COVID virus, because they don't even believe that there are viruses out there. They don't even know what these uh, researchers or doctors or health workers are talking about. What do you mean? What's this virus thingy that you're talking about? Okay, so uh, let's get that one settled. Okay, this is what you see under the scanning electron microscope. Now, I was certified on a scanning electron microscope. I knew how to run it. I would see things not of this nature. I would see uh, semiconductor chips, very tiny chips, transistors, that kind of thing. But I, I understand what a semi... Uh, what one of these uh, SEMS is, a uh, scanning electron microscope. There is a more powerful one known as the atomic force microscope. And this is what they see under the scope, under these high power scopes. You know, here you see all these different types of viruses. Now, you don't want to call them virus. You want to call them X. I don't care. There's something there, okay? And so for you to say that this is not there, it just shows ignorance. That's all it is. Because this is like the flat earther saying that the earth is flat. You know, if the earth is round, uh, spherical, and you say that it's flat, or that black is white, you know, that on is off, uh, well, you're, you're, you're just being uh, either ignorant, foolish, you know, you, you just look up the words. Now, you have to look at this and say, you got to give these things a name. They see these things under the scope. Okay, you don't have to believe in what they are. You know, you have you may have all the theories you want, but you have to recognize that these things are things that they see under the scope, under the scanning electron microscope. Okay, so whatever name you give these thingies, I don't care. They call them viruses. You can't say that the virus does not exist. Okay, that's my first argument. So. Uh, uh, if you say no, that you don't believe in viruses, well, you go to jail and you don't collect 200. Okay, that's my take on that. Now, do the viruses cause disease? And that's a big if. Not everybody agrees. And there I can't tell you much because, you know, I'm not in that field. There's a field I'm not very much interested in. I've said that in the past, okay, but I'm just saying that this is those people who are interested in the subject. These are the questions you should ask yourself and go do the research. You know, make sure that you understand uh, what you're rooting for, okay? If you believe that viruses don't exist, you have a problem because there is something under the scope. Now, do you think those little balls that you see in there, they cause disease? That's a second question, okay? And uh, here's one fellow, and he pointed me to a um, video, and he says, look at this video, Bill. Okay, so I watched a little bit. I haven't watched all of it because I got the sense of it in the first, uh, I think the video ran like 45 minutes. I, I saw only like 35 minutes, and there were two more videos of this stuff, so I didn't go through all of it. But this was the overall picture for, from the first half hour, okay? Uh, fellow, this uh, Dr. Trent, he says, there's lots of diseases that are caused by environmental factors, such as pollution, uh, sewers, hygiene, etc., okay? Uh, vaccines are developed in rodents and monkeys, but these animals carry other viruses 
that are later passed on to you with a vaccine. You know, sometimes the manufacturing process is not careful enough. Some of these other viruses that, you know, belong to these monkeys, these rodents, they're passed on to you with a vaccine. And they say, well, this is the vaccine. This is the COVID vaccine. We give you the shot and you get, you know, the other viruses that you never bargained for. Could happen. Yeah, okay? uh, I, can, I can at least understand what he's saying. I can imagine that it could happen. Um, it is, and another notion that this uh, doctor was saying is it's not wise to let the public about all that's uh, involved in vaccine R&D and manufacturing because it might create a panic. In other words, the common man does not always understand what's going on in the research centers, and he might imagine more than what's there and imagine the worst. And so governments uh, are careful with the information that reaches the public and the establishment, the health establishment, sometimes says, don't tell this to the public. Because if you tell the public, they don't really understand. They're going to go into panic. They're not going to want the vaccine. And they're just going to be doing more damage to themselves than what it's worth. The vaccine is good. But these people you know, are going to interpret it in the wrong way. So we might as well not give them the information. And other doctors who are aware of the information says, ah, oh, they're hiding the information because they know it's going to uh, scare the public. Why? Because the public is going to be aware that there are problems. And so it's a uh, damned if you do and damned if you don't situation. And that's what this doctor was saying. One of the arguments he raised, he says that the establishment doesn't always want to give information to the public. Okay. And then another issue is critics are systematically silenced on or given a career redirection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, there were people like uh, Mrs. Eddy, if you look her up, E-D-D-Y, and uh, she criticized a lot of these investigations, these R&Ds, these researches, and the conclusions they draw from, uh, drew from them, and uh, she was given new assignments, saying, uh, we need you over here. <laughs> so they pulled her out and put her in another place where she caused less of a trouble, and there's a lot of whistleblowers within the health industries, not a lot, but there's always a percentage of them that say, you know, I don't, I think these people are lying. I think these people are not doing the right thing. They're not telling the public what's really going on. And you know what the health officials say, look, you're in the way, because if you tell that to the public, you're going to create this bigger monster than what we're trying to do here. And so they move them away or they try to silence them, etc. And more or less what's happening in the mathematical physics establishment where, you know, anyone who opposes that is considered a uh, dissident, uh, meaning that you're considered a nerd. <laughs> you know, you're, you're considered a, um, a person who's not in tune with a mathematical establishment, okay? And so they move you aside. They don't even pay attention to you. They censor you because you're opposing the establishment. I know a little bit about that because I've been there 20 years, and so I can sympathize with them with these uh, people who oppose the establishment. Now, whether uh, you do more damage in the health industry than you do in the mathematical establishment, where they're t dealing with theories, abstract theories of how this universe works, I think those situa two situations are different, okay? But yeah, I can understand that some people on the inside uh, see uh, things that they don't like and that they think are anti, um, or not in the public interest, and so they want to whistleblow. They want to, you know, uh, tattletale on, uh, on what the establishment is doing. And one of them was, again, uh, my mom. She, she worked in, the, uh, in a hospital, and she worked later on with a dentist, and she saw things that she didn't like at all. You know, a lot of commercialism, uh, the drug peddler coming over to the doctor saying, sell this drug for me, and you'll get a 10% bonus, and that kind of thing. And so she saw a lot of things she didn't like. And so, yeah, I can understand a little bit about this. It's human nature. That's how we all are, you know. Okay, uh, another one, the case histories of people who got this or that vaccine and succumbed to the disease anyways. And then you have the vaccine such as polio, uh, according to this, all caused cancer. So, you know, you have all this stuff and you listen to a guy like him. And the question is, should you believe him or should you take what he says as a grain, of, you know, with a grain of salt? Uh, what should you do? You know, unless you're uh, it really in the business, it's kind of like weird. What should you do? What should you believe? And you have all this information out there, and you have two sides to the question. You have the establishment, and if you don't like the establishment, you say, oh, they're lying. 
you may be choosing the wrong side. You know, I mean, I can't tell you. All I can say is that uh, there's a lot of politics involved, a lot of interest involved, and that gets in the way of the truth, okay, whatever the truth is. Okay, um, here you have uh, how the virus really works, okay? It makes copies of itself, right, and uh, inside the cell, and then uh, pollutes other cells. This is, how the, this is the theory, right, behind it. Do you believe in this theory? Well, you know, again, it's... Uh, it depends on on you if if you're going to believe this or not you know and then if you do believe that this is what happens the question is um whether what you're going to do about it how do you think this should be cured assuming you believe that viruses exist viruses cause disease viruses uh, there is this virus called covid which is different than all the others okay and then assuming you accept all that right are you going to take that next step and ask the question, what should we do about it? And these people, the health experts, they've decided that the way to combat it is through um, uh, chem chemically. In other words, you create a uh, what is known as a vaccine, and they're going to inject it to you. It's going to create antibodies so that if the virus hits you, you know you are in contact with the virus, and it enters your body, and it tries to attack your cells. Well, then uh, this anti, these antibodies work to help prevent that. They attacked this virus. Now, the virus is not a living entity. And, I, you know, you have a lot of doctors out there that don't even understand that. And that's what, because they never define what life is, what a living entity is. Biology to this day has not done that across the planet. No university on the planet, no biologist on the planet has defined the word life. They say, well, it's that which reproduces, it sleeps, uh, takes a dump every morning. Uh, uh, they, they talk about what the thing does, and they try to define it in, based on what a thing does. And actually, you know, it, it is what a thing does, but there's only one common factor, and that's that they all, any living entity, moves against gravity. Actually, it moves against the path of least resistance. That's the formal definition we propose. But the primary issue is gravity. If you can move against gravity, you're not a rock. You're not in an inert thing, okay? So that's the bottom line. And the question is, you know, a virus is just a molecule. It's a little round ball-like molecule, not always uh, in the case of the rabies virus. It's like a cylinder. Right? There are different types of viruses. But the point is, it's an inert molecule, a very complex molecule built with uh, proteins, etc. And what it does is, once it uh, enters the uh, cell, inside the cell, it uses the cell material, living material, it eats it up from the inside and makes copies of itself that later on sprout and infect other cells and do the same thing to those cells. That's the theory. Whether you believe it or not, that is the theory, okay? And so the question is, do you think that's what this COVID thing does? And if you decide that it does, that that's what the theory is, and you think it's a good theory, unless someone produces something different, right, out there, well, then you have to conclude that you got to attack it somehow. You have to address it somehow. And the way these health professionals have decided that they're going to attack it is through um, chem chemistry. They're going to create a vaccine, which... At, uh, creates antibodies within your body. That's essentially a chemical process. And if the bug comes, you come in contact with the bug, then you have defenses against it. They will attack that virus, meaning they're going to break the molecule up or they're going to render it inert or whatever. Okay, they're going to neutralize it. That's the theory. Okay. Okay. So, you know, the, uh, I'm just saying that that's the checklist that any rational person, anyone who wants to reach to the bottom of the issue, wants to be objective about it, uh, you should ask those questions to yourself. Do the research on those topics, at least. Maybe you've got some better questions, no problem. But the issue is you have to attack your own beliefs. Then you know you're solid in your beliefs. But to say, well, I don't think there's any bug out there. I don't think that uh, there is such a thing as COVID or that it causes disease. I think this is just a, a thing from the, uh, from the ruling classes. So far, you have said nothing to a rational individual, okay? It's not a question of belief. 
it's a question of do your research as much as possible, you know, and find out whether you are solid, that you can um, present an argument, for, an argument for each one of these questions. Are there viruses? Yes or no? Is a virus, uh, does a virus cause disease? Is there such a thing as a COVID virus? And if you say yes to all of those, then the question is, you know, what should we do about it? Okay, okay moving on here. Uh, here we have another situation. We have the International Business Times that says, who, you know, the World Health Organization sees unprecedented Omicron spread probably in most countries. And the EU is to decide on new COVID jab as Omicron rages. You know, and there you have the coffins in Germany. Uh, one picture that they show, like saying, uh, you know, uh, beware, this thing is out there, it's going to kill you. And so this is a little bit of fear mongering. Okay? You see all these cases in one week uh, in uh, the entire planet, okay, there. Uh, and so the question is, you know, here you have another side of that story that came out. Uh, the other day that I pointed out to, it says the Omicron variant, you know, considerable protection against severe disease is maintained. They're saying that, uh, they're saying that the Omicron is out there, right? But you don't have to worry too much about it if you have at least two shots already, two jabs, because it already protects you more or less against this Omicron as far as they can tell. And at the bottom you say, Omicron, no need for a variant specific booster at this time. Okay, so why are they raising so much hell about this Omicron if the two vax that I got, you know, I got on my shoulder, and I think it was in this one, I can't remember anymore. Uh, you know, the, the two shots that I got apparently defend me or protect me against the Omicron. You know, there's a new variant called the Omicron. Apparently, uh, uh, um, uh, other than two or three modifications, you know, mutations, it's got like 10 mutations over the Delta, or at least to the original uh, COVID. I can't, can't remember which one, but the point is there's more variations in the new strain known as Omicron. Okay, great. I don't care. I mean, does the, or do the two vaccines that I got protect me against the Omicron? Yes or no? It's a black or white issue. And these people are saying, yes, they do. That apparently it, you know, softens the blow or whatever. So why are we developing a new vaccine against the Omicron? Why are we uh, closing the entire planet again? Apparently, we're starting for this new uh, winter session, closing up uh, all these places, restaurants, hotels, tourism, etc. cetera. <clears throat> uh, why are we closing everything down if the Omicron is just a variant of the Delta or of the COVID, original COVID, the Alpha, or whatever it's called? And whatever vaccine you have in you is sufficient to protect you against the Omicron. You know, why are we raising a panic again in the world of economics because there's a health issue? And like I covered last time, you know, right now Russia showed 16 cases, <clears throat> Cuba showed four, and other countries show, you know, very few. We're talking about 8 billion people being locked down because four people have a disease which apparently hasn't killed them yet. There was one case apparently in London, in, in England, where one person died. Should we stop the entire planet because one person died and some people, a handful, you know, we're talking about 10, 20 people, have the new Omicron variant and they get maybe sick or maybe they don't even get sick, they didn't even know they had it. Should we shut down the global economy because of this? This is where you have to stop and think, is this uh, real or not? Is there something else going on? Is this politics? 